The debates between realism and liberalism appear to be insufficient after the Second World War. The transformations of the 20th century seem to show that what liberalism had proposed was impractical. From the second half of the 20th century onwards, there was a new debate of a more methodological nature. On the one hand, we have ideas that have been consolidated in the US with the professionalization of the area, which is involved in a more positivist science concept and associated with the natural sciences. This was part of how the American academia functioned at the time. On the other hand, we have a set of actors who have chosen to resist this transformation about how you produce knowledge in the social world and have chosen to continue to value history and philosophy. They realized they needed to think about the problems of international relations without talking exclusively about the European international system and its problems. Thus, there is a need to understand how different configurations of power organize the relationship between societies, how norms are involved in this process, the circumstances within which choices are made, and the perspective that influences decision-making. There are three traditions to point out. We will begin with the Hobbesian or Machiavellian, which largely corresponds to realism. Political nature and international politics are understood from the state of nature. We see the political dilemmas to be faced in light of the problem of human nature. This is important for two reasons. There is no sociability before the contract, and any right is founded by the Leviathan. If we start from this point of view, it radically changes how we deal with the problem of politics. For those who are in the Hobbesian tradition, how is the social world structured? What happens when we say that they do not know each other and don't have a rule to regulate our actions and no one knows what to expect from others? We have a condition of dispute and it is war for power, in which nobody can be trusted. If at some point there's a degree of stability, this is not permanent, it is unstable. The state of nature is not a state of permanent violence but of permanent insecurity. In this, war is always a possibility. Given that this is the universe in which we work, what is the ethics that should guide your decision? It is the idea of the ethics of responsibility. Also, there is great concern about survival. In this scenario, balance of power is necessary to achieve stability. If you want to know more about the ethics of responsibility and about balance of power, check out the last videos about realism. Lockean or Kantian tradition. This tradition is a more moderate version of liberalism. It is based on the idea of natural law. In Kant's thought, we see the idea of humanity's general will. The Groschen section tries to show that Hobbes had a misconception of the state of nature itself. Two elements change the understanding of authors like Locke regarding the state of nature. The first is on the issue of sociability. Instinctively, man knows that he cannot exist alone. He develops, evolves because of cooperation within communities. We have something transmitted within the thousands of years of human evolution that induces the subject to cooperation. It is the idea that but even without established rules, it does not make sense to think that people will fundamentally seek violence against each other. Man is social and seeks structures of cooperation to improve survival. This sociability inherent to human nature means that what happens in the context of the pre-social world is not exactly what Hobbes saw. Second, we have the idea that even though we do not have a right founded by the state, this does not mean that we don't have a natural right. Natural law is this understanding of something that is the prerogative of the individual, inseparable from him. Regardless of whether you have socialized or not, certain things imply someone's right. In Lockean reflection, even in the context without pre-established coexistence rules, the person who kills someone, for example, knows that he is violating another person's right. This happens even without something agreed between them. This is something prior to social construction. It is a notion of law that does not depend on the state to elaborate that right constitutionally and put it in writing. For Locke, this is self-evident. For this type of liberalism, we have three orders of law that predate sociability. The right to life, to freedom, and to property. You cannot kill someone without knowing that you are violating that person's rights. This is important for two reasons. First, because it inaugurates an idea that did not exist in Hobbes. It inaugurates the idea that there was law before the state. For Hobbes, because there is a state of absolute insecurity, there is nothing stable. So, there is a concern about the war. Furthermore, that is why the state is so important to him. It is the state that guarantees the right to life, freedom and property, and guarantees the conditions for its prosperity. For Hobbes, this is all born with the state. For Locke, these things are prior to any political structure that aims to protect them. You don't build the state to have the right. We generate it to protect the right we already had before. We have an ethics in which preserving a certain lifestyle is as important as preserving the physical and material integrity of the state. Thus, there is value in the investment in keeping commitments for the long term. 
Even if in the short term it doesn't seem practical to do so, the continuity of that culture seems as relevant as the material integrity of the territory. So we have a new norm different from realism. This idea of spontaneous sociability generates the fact that at different times we make different agreements. There are different ethics that regulate the lives of these individuals, and the appropriate mechanisms to give stability to that configuration vary a lot from case to case. For the English school, there are different types of mechanisms to regulate the international system. Even war is an important instrument. You may need to wage war against someone to preserve your commitment to another force for some reason. We do not have a clear mechanism for stabilizing power. We have different mechanisms that, according to the circumstances of the situation, will prove to be the most adequate mechanism for the stabilization of power. Rousseau, Kant. It is another aspect of liberalism. We have a universal idea of humanity prior to sociability. It is an idea of humanity in common. Men are the same and want the same things. Even if political communities do not clearly recognize this, the nature of political conflict is fundamentally the conflict between the general will, this interest of humanity, and the particular interests of different groups. We have defined a view of moral universalism. It is always ethically superior to preserve the interest of humanity when it is in conflict with the interests of certain groups. The idea is that there is a conflict between the universal and the particular, and the universal is always ethically superior to the particular. The consequence of this is that you are always in the context of the possibility of revolt against the current political institution, a revolt against the state. Because of this conflict, for some authors, it is interpreted that this is a view on the problem of politics that will lead you in the direction of instability. Thus, we have different ideas. One is realism. It is focused on the idea that the Leviathan founded the state and the law at the same time. We have the idea of rationalism which is based on the idea of natural law, in which sociability is something inherent to human beings. It leads to a spontaneous construction of commitments that will be the condition for the possibility of culture. This condition of possibility of culture generates the agreements and preserving them will be a fundamental element to guide your decision. We have revolutionism, where the political conflict fundamentally materializes in the opposition between the general interest of humanity and the particular interest of different groups. The general interest of humanity is always ethically superior to the particular interest of groups. This makes the way you see the context of the political decision different. You are always part of a moral universalism, and this leads you to a condition of always mobilizing to confront the state's willingness to sacrifice the general interest in the name of private interests. So why learn this? To understand that, as people are oriented by these different ways of seeing the problem of politics, they make decisions and society organizes around the consequences of these decisions. Therefore, we have different social configurations. Just as we have different social configurations at the national level, we also have different configurations at the level of the relationship between societies. Thus, we have three forms of configuration. International system. We have the international system, which is marked by the presence of interdependence. If what happens to one force does not change what happens to another, it is not an international system. It is the set of relations between countries that do not share a common culture, but are in a context of interdependence. This means that what happens to one country affects another. Even if they do not have friendly diplomatic relations, even if they don't share values, there is a great degree of interdependence. International society. We have an international society in which there is a rivalry, but it is regulated. There is a set of clear rules about how far rivalry can go. Therefore, there is a certain stability that allows the combination of practices, cooperation with practices of conflict. It is when a group of organizations have a common historical trajectory and diplomatic ties from previous centuries. We have diplomatic institutions and strong trade networks between countries and empires. Therefore, we have clear orders about what can be done between states. World society. We have the idea of world society, which is a fragile idea, and as far as the authors write, it was never realized in its entirety. But it is a valid principle to move society in a direction where the degree of integration with other societies is such that you are willing to build norms that regulate the relationship between individuals and not the relationship between states within that universe. It is a set of societies that share principles so clear that norms are created to regulate the interaction between the individuals of that society. We have the idea that certain societies can achieve such a high degree of integration 
they begin to have strength and create movements that try to build norms aimed at individuals. So what are these three settings used for? The authors seek to show that the role of this concept is to understand reality in a dynamic way, because it will be useful in the analysis of the dynamics of a given society and to be able to see how in that scenario certain groups seek to lead, for example, from a world society point of view, where certain groups are going to try to go in a different direction. If we look at the context of the 70s, we have a process of globalization of the international system of European states. The set of rules that organized European societies became the form of political and diplomatic organization across the globe. Before the Second World War, the law and diplomacy that regulated the relationship between US and Europe was different from the law and diplomacy that regulated the relationship between Europeans and the colonies. The colonies had a very different legal status, so we didn't have a global international system before a Second World War and decolonization. What happened in World War II is that in the context where we have the political emancipation of those units under the control of Europeans in Africa and Southeast Asia, these people choose to organize themselves politically with national states and integrate into this European international system. So for the first time in history, a system that was once located in one space expands to occupy the space of the globe as a whole. This brings possibilities and problems. It is easier to produce diplomacy between European powers that have a common culture and a consolidated diplomatic practice. When we incorporate political forces completely foreign to that historical and cultural trajectory within this institutional political system, what happens is that the cultural divergence between these countries is very large and this increases the possibility of conflict. The first thing they point out about this configuration is that the transition process needs to be read as a process through which the universalization of the European international system had a clear and established practice, and it is transformed into a system in which we no longer have a certain compatibility among political forces. Therefore, without this common culture capable of building agreements, it makes the relationship between these forces more difficult to regulate. So there is an increasing potential for conflicts, even within institutions. In this, the Third World Movement was born. Hadley Boo calls it revolt against the West. At the turn of the 20th century, European and Western powers expressed a sense of self-assurance both about the durability of their position in international society and its moral purpose. That, however, did not survive the First World War. From that point on, a revolt against Western dominance unfolded in five phases or themes, which Bo identified it as an anti-colonial revolution and the struggle for equal sovereignty, racial equality, economic justice, and cultural liberation. This was brought about five factors. There was a weakening of the will on the part of the Western powers to maintain their position of dominance or to at least accept the costs necessary to do so. The rise of new powers such as the Soviet Union, a more general equilibrium of power, and a transformation of the legal and moral climate of international relations, which was influenced by the majorities of votes held by the third world states. These countries that are products of decolonization will be integrated into the United Nations system and will modify the entire dynamics of the activities of these organizations. When the UN was created in the 1940s, it had around 60 countries. After 1965, the UN had more than 150 countries. Those countries that entered as a colony and recently integrated do not share European culture. They go into those decision-making mechanisms and often take ownership of these mechanisms, like the General Assembly, and use that to promote their agenda and not the agenda of the countries that created the organization. At the same time, in the same historical set, in the 60s, we see several important social movements, such as the Black Movement, civil rights, gay rights, and more. We have these networks that try to build a worldview based on the idea of transnational solidarity. The American Civil Rights Movement is a group of Americans protesting American action in Vietnam. In this way, it is not within the national interest, but within the scope of transnational solidarity. Human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch are created at this point. At the same time that the internationalization of the state system generates conflict, these transnational networks seek to create political platforms for solidarity between individuals and not between states. 
The tension that marks the transition that the international system went through in the 70s is that tension of the conflict between the political forces generated by the expansion of the international system and the bonds of solidarity created by these new transnational forces. In the 90s, there was the end of bipolarity, there was humanitarian interventions and a new international order. We can see a new set of mechanisms being used. On the one hand, there is the euphoria that liberalism is the only effective way of thinking about the political world, thinking about institutions from the point of view of their relationship between liberalism and democracy. And there was the proposal to universalize this model as a political unit, since it was the result for the stability of the international system around the planet. In the 90s, we had a strengthened narrative of humanitarian interventions. They used the idea of democratic peace. There is a pressure for the universalization of a model because they believe that it will allow a degree of solidarity on the globe that will make the world more stable. There is a desire to transform the countries of the world into democratic countries, not only because we want it personally, it is because if there is a democratization of the whole world, communication between different communities will be easier and therefore it will make it more difficult for them to enter into war with each other. So there is the idea of democratic peace. If all the countries in the world were democracies, we would have no war between communities. We have this emphasis on materializing and taking advantage of this new moment in the international order to materialize this idea of transnationalizing the international system through the supposed victory of liberal democracy. This process of expanding liberal democracy, democratic elections, human rights, economic freedom, and more, is seen as a process that creates the possibility of stability in the system that benefits humanity as a whole and not a country in particular. On the other hand, as a way of resisting, we have a group of people who reinforce the idea of non-intervention and the right to be different. The international system can only work if the units in that system have some degree of decision-making autonomy. For that, we cannot impose your culture on them. Thus, we have two narratives that will lead to the reflection of the English school that mark the tension that opens with the trans transformations of the 90s. The 90s are marked by international solidarism. It is the idea of solidarity through democratic peace and humanitarian intervention. And we also have international pluralism, in which the stability of that system depends on the construction of mechanisms that have sufficient autonomy for political communities to preserve their culture, manage their spaces, have their particularity, and be part of a plural international system. Without this plurality, we do not have an international system, but an imperial system. Thank you for watching.